All right, we're on. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, awesome. Uh, how's everyone's reinforce going? Pretty good? Yeah, sweet. Um, we're here to talk about network visibility. Uh, we've got a bunch of content we want to jump through today. Um, really cool things to cover. Um, I'm Matt Lewis. I'm one of the principal solution architects for AWS. We've also got Anoop Dewani here from our EC2 networking team and Dave Burke from our Amazon.com team, uh, one of our senior um, or principal security engineers. Now, before we get into the visibility piece, I just want to set the scene. So, um, Networking is really the foundation of any deployment that you build in AWS. So I want to build some networky things first. We'll cover it pretty quickly, um, but it is pretty straightforward stuff, I hope. So if we've got an Amazon region, we've got some Elastic Compute, we've got some RDS or Relational Database Service, we've got our Elastic MapReduce or EMR, maybe an instance that could be running anything. Uh, this is all within your AWS account. Now, if we kind of take a closer look at that, we're really using EC2, we're using Amazon VPC, and then inside that VPC, we have things like availability zones. We've got subnets, either public subnets, which are accessible via the internet, private subnets. We've got EC2 instances within those subnets. So when you deploy in multiple availability zones, you're gonna deploy EC2 instances in subnets that are tied to availability zones. Then we have the public internet. Then we have all of our public services like S3, DynamoDB, uh, Lambda, IoT, etc. And you'll see a clear difference here where you've got the Amazon VPC, but then you've got public services that actually sit outside of the VPC as well. So if we take it down another level even further, um, what controls traffic within the VPC is really routing. So we have a route table per subnet in this case, and we've got this local route, which means that any instance within the VPC can communicate with each other. We've got all of these services outside of the VPC, and we'd have either a default route via an internet gateway, which is that uh, purple icon in the middle there. And we can send traffic to public services, the internet, our private subnets might have a default route via a NAT instance or hopefully NAT gateway, which is much more scalable. And now you've got instances that sit in private subnets and public subnets, they can talk to each other, they can communicate with public services and they can communicate with the internet. We also have things like VPC endpoints for private connectivity to S3 DynamoDB. We have what's called a VGW or virtual private gateway which connects to a direct connect. Um, I noticed a couple of folks are taking photos. I actually have a, a pause at the end of this, which is totally built out and you can take a full photo. So I know it gets frustrating try, trying to take a photo as we kind of go along here. So we also have um, VPC peering, which connects to other VPCs. And you'll notice we're filling out the routes on the uh, left-hand side there, left-hand side. We have Transit Gateway, which is what we launched at reInvent last year. So that's going to be a highly scalable mechanism to connect to many VPCs, up to 5,000 VPCs, in fact. And we also have AWS Private Link. So you might have a SaaS provider behind an NLB inside a, a SaaS VPC. We have VPC flow logs giving you some form of visibility. We're going to dive into flow logs. And then Global Accelerator, which sits outside at our, at our edge locations. So as it stands today, this is what a VPC architecture really looks like. These are all of the uh, bolt-on options, if you will, that sit and plug into a VPC and allow you to have full network communi communication between public services, private services, multiple VPCs, your on-premises, et cetera. So that said, how do we get visibility into your AWS network traffic? So first, we're going to start with VPC flow logs. So a VPC flow log is really, if we have a look here, we've got uh, three different sources. And I'll dive into actually what a flow log looks like in a second, but we've got a VPC, a subnet, and an elastic network interface on an EC2 instance inside the VPC. So each one of these is a flow log source that we can enable. Our destinations on the right-hand side here, whoops, um, can be Amazon CloudWatch or Amazon S3. So we can send our flow logs to either of these destinations. Now, if we have a look at what a flow log looks like, we'll kind of build this out reasonably quickly and then I'll pause so you can take a photo if you like. Um, so the flow log itself starts with a version, so the flow log's version. It has the account ID, so the account ID that it's sourced from, the interface ID, so the ENI of the instance, for example, the source IP address and the destination IP address, source port, destination port, protocol, or the uh, IANA protocol number, the packets, uh, bytes, the start and end um, of the capture window for this uh, flow, and the action, so if the flow log was accepted, 
and I'll dive into that in just a second, and then the, the log status. And this is basically what a flow log looks like um, in its completeness. So flow logs are really a building block for much deeper visibility into your VPC. So we can capture uh, what it looks like or what IP traffic is going between your instances or between an instance and the outside world and look at the actual flow record or the flow log of that traffic. Um, we can also use that to troubleshoot security groups or, or network ACLs if we like as well. So let's dive into a really simple example here showing communication within a VPC. So we've got two subnets, we've got two EC2 instances, two ENIs, we've got a couple of private addresses there inside the VPC, and we've got two security groups, ABC and DEF. Now if we have a look at the security groups, we're actually referencing each other, so each security group references the other and allows traffic between the two instances. So what we're doing here, instance A and instance B can communicate with each other. So we have full two-way communications. Oops. Um, so with um, VPC flow logs, we can actually look at the log for that traffic. Now, in this case, we've got connectivity between the two instances, great. So the flow log for this particular entry, uh, we've got the ENI, the source address, which is the 10.1.1.15, the destination address, the 10.1.1.17, the source port, destination port, and in this case, the action was accepted because it was allowed by the security group. So if we keep going here, and we look at a security group where we're actually not allowing full two-way communications. Sorry, just a couple of build-outs here. In this case, the first uh, security group, ABC, is only allowing traffic from 10.5.1.0 slash 24, and that's actually outside of the range of the, v the instance we want to communicate with. So in this case, instance A can talk to instance B, but B can't talk to A. So if we have a look at the flow log entry for For this, we basically see that the first entry from A to B, it's accepted, but the second entry is actually rejected. So we can get some visibility into, hey, traffic isn't actually reaching my instance here through flow logs themselves. So flow logs can be sent to Amazon CloudWatch, Amazon S3, and also Amazon Athena. And, um, I've got a couple of links here, I'd pause if you guys are interested. There's a couple of use cases around integrating with Athena, for example. And then also we have customers that have taken flow logs and enriched those to get more visibility into um, what the traffic that's going through their VPC. So in this case, we've got a reInvent session where Netflix actually took flow logs and, and enriched that to get more visibility. So feel free to check that one out as well. And we have a public case study for Netflix. Lots of links for you guys there on flow logs. Alrighty. So that's flow logs. And I would almost say that's an introduction to VPC visibility. Um, yesterday we actually launched something new, VPC traffic mirroring, which is really what the focus of the rest of this session is going to be. Um, so we've got a noob here. He's going to give us a, a really great intro on to what VPC traffic mirroring looks like. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. So yesterday we launched a feature called Traffic Mirroring. It's a VPC feature that you can use to monitor your VPC infrastructure traffic um, with any uh, monitoring or security appliance of your choice. Uh, for use cases like content inspection, threat detection, it lets you do things like deep packet inspection, look at your, uh, let you look at the full traffic, including the payload. So, you know, really the traffic mirror, VPC traffic mirroring is is, it's a fiber tap in the cloud. It, it works very similar to how you know, a, a light travels between the two medium, and when it travels, you have uh, you know, an incident ray coming in, a part of the, uh, that light actually gets refracted, and part of that gets reflected. In the same way, um, what happens with VPC traffic mirroring is, as the network packets are flowing over your network interfaces, um, a part of the packet, that you want to monitor can be sent to a minute, uh, monitoring appliance. So let's let's at a very high level, at, at its core, let's take a look at what, you know what how does this feature work. So let's say you have in your VPC an EC2 instance, um, and there's some traffic flowing in and out. You have green packets coming in, blue packets going on. That's basically your inbound and outbound traffic. 
and you decided to monitor these traffic. This happens to be one of the critical workload in your VPC, and you want to know, you know what kind of traffic is coming in and out. Uh, for that, all you have to do is, until you know, starting yesterday, you could actually go in your VPC console or use um, you know, CLI or API and create a mirror session. Uh, by default, there are no mirror sessions, so you have to create a mirror session. Um, and be but before you create a mirror session, you need to create a mirroring instance, uh, an, an appliance where you will analyze the traffic. Um, you, so now you have an EC2 instance in your VPC or somewhere else, we'll get into you know, where these e uh, monitoring appliances can be deployed. You have a uh, mirroring instance, and uh, it has its ENI, and you go and now create mirror session. Um, you click uh, create mirror session, there are a bunch of things, we'll get into the details of how to create a session. Once you do that, um, the ENI on the mirror source, with the EC2 instance that you want to monitor, has been enabled with traffic mirroring. And once, you, once it's enabled with traffic mirroring, um, all packets that were going in and out can be mirrored to an instance, a monitoring instance, which, which is an out-of-band out of monitoring or a security appliance that can actually uh, look at your traffic, do things like forensic you know, content inspection, threat detection, and things like that. Uh, a bit about what type of monitoring appliances you can use. You can use anything. Uh, you can build your own uh, analyzer, traffic analyzer. You could use open source analyzer, or you could use um, you know, solution from one of uh, several partners that we have, uh, and, and they're, you know, the, the listings or the AMI and appliances uh, available on AWS Marketplace. Um, so why did we build VPC traffic mirroring? Um, you know, our customers have been asking for this feature for a long time. Um, they have deployed their critical workloads in VPC. They have their production network uh, working in, in AWS environment. And, uh, you know, they want to monitor. They've been asking us for an easy and a scalable solution that, can monitor, that they can use to monitor their traffic. They need to keep an eye out on, uh, you know, that unusual traffic pattern, or they want to um, inspect the content that would signify that there is maybe an intrusion in their network or maybe a workload has been compromised. So all of these use cases are now possible with this feature. There is um, another key use case that our customers have been you know, asking this feature for, which is for troubleshooting and diagnostic purpose. A lot of times before you want to deploy an application for, in production, um, you might have various microservices, various applications running, and you want to see how they, you know, how they are talking to each other. What are the blind spots? What are the choke, choke points between the applications? Uh, so, so troubleshooting and diagnostic uh, is another essential use case that um, this feature will be will come handy for. But, you know, customers have been doing these uh, monitoring in cloud for some time. So, what are the, what is the benefit of traffic mirroring? Well, there are several benefits. Um, the one until yesterday, if you were to monitor traffic from your EC2 instance, um, you had to install an agent in the user space in EC2 instance. That agent would actually look at the or monitor or look at the traffic which is going in and out of a network interface of that EC2 instance, copy that and send it out. Um, that actually that agent uh, approach is it, it turns out is pretty complex and. It's not scalable. Our customers want a native feature. Um, you know, as their number of EC2 instance or monitoring endpoint grows, um, it's 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 a bit complex to manage the agents, install them on EC2 instance, and things like that. So, this is a native feature. You don't need any agent. Uh, it will actually get copied. Your pack, packets will get copied from the network in, interface. There is no CPU penalty that occurs when you enable traffic mirroring. The second thing, and the most critical thing, is the security posture. A lot of our security conscious customers, um, they don't want to look at or want to take traffic from the user space itself. You know, um, if if an uh, agent is running in user space and if a workload is already compromised, you can tamper with the mirror traffic as well. Um, this particular feature actually copies traffic right out, out of, of the Elastic Network interface of an EC2 uh, instance which means that um, once you enable it, once an administrator enables this feature, uh, you cannot tamper with the mirror packet or even disable traffic mirroring from the user space. This comes in handy when you really want to monitor um, a, a source and uh, you can be rest assured that you're really looking at the packets which are coming in and out of your EC2 instance. 
And then the third thing is the wide range of uh, options now you have. Our customers want to monitor traffic using different um, uh, appliances. They, might, they want to monitor maybe one type of traffic with one of the appliances and other type of traffic with other appliances. It is possible. With agents, you kind of get locked into one particular vendor. With traffic monitoring, uh, you can actually use multiple tools. So let's take a quick look at what traffic mirroring is you know, about. How do you configure it? What are the key components of it? There are three components of traffic mirroring. One is the target, another is the filter, and then third is the session. Um, those of you who have worked in the on-prem world, you, these are you know, typical. You create a mirror session. You have a port you know, similar to how you configure things on fiber tap, tap aggregation, or a router or a switch. So let's talk about, uh, look into each of these components in detail. Target, right? Target is your destination for mirror traffic. Um, as of now, there are two targets that are possible with traffic mirroring. One is the elastic, elastic network interface of an EC2 instance, or a network load balance. So now here, it's a key thing. When you send your mirror traffic to a destination, you have to make sure that you're not oversubscribing that destination. You, you're not sending 100 gig of a traffic of mirror traffic to an instance that can only do one gig or a 10 gig, right? So it's important that you make sure that your the 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 the, the target has enough capacity. If you if you don't know how much of traffic you will be mirroring, we highly recommend using network load balancing. Two days ago, we uh, launched a feature on NLB, which is which now sub, with that feature now um, you can have a UDP listener on NLB. So mirror traffic is a UDP traffic. We'll talk about that in a detail, in more detail uh, in, in a bit. But you can actually run your analyzer in auto scaling group behind an NLB, and, and then you can scale up and down your analyzer based on how much of the traffic you want to mirror. You can have multiple source sending traffic to a, a, a one target. The, so you know, you, it's not, you're not limited to one is to one. Um, the, ta the type of target you use, uh, there are limits associated with it. If you are using a network load balancer, there is no limit. If you are using dedicated hosts, hosts um, you can have up to 100 source pointing to one uh, mirror, uh, mirror target. And if you're using some lower instance size, you can have up to 10 source per, per target. Very important thing, when we send the mirror traffic to target, you need to make sure that your target has a security group that allows uh, you know, UDP traffic on 487, port 4879. This is a VXLAN uh, port. We encapsulate the traffic with VXLAN. Um, so it is important that you enable your security group to allow this traffic. You can just have to have one, one rule where you allow UDP traffic on this port on your ingress security group. So that was target. Let's talk about filters. Now, filters come in really handy. Um, let's say, let's take a scenario in this uh, picture or diagram, you have an EC2 instance that you want to monitor. It already has traffic mirroring enabled on it. And let's say you decide that you want to monitor all inbound traffic, but you don't want to monitor outbound traffic. In that case, you can just simply create a filter on your traffic mirroring session. You say, I just want an inbound traffic to go and uh, be mirrored, and we'll, you will be able to do that. Before we talk about you know, filtering options, let's take a quick look at the packet format. As I mentioned that, mirrored packet is encapsulated with VXLAN. We, we copy the packet right out of the network interface, which means that you actually get to see the layer two headers on the network interface of that EC2 instance as well. What we do is that we may encapsulate that layer two packet into an IP packet. Uh, it's, a, it's a UDP packet with VXLAN, so the outer IP head, header has an IP address, source IP address of the ENI that you are mirroring. Uh, the destination address is the target you, you are sending the traffic to. Uh, UDP header has the destination port of 4879. And you have a VXLAN header. In, in VXLAN header, when you create that tra traffic mirroring session, you get an option to set your se VXLAN ID as well. So you have up to 16 million options to set this VXLAN ID. And it can come in handy when you're trying to, let's say, deploy uh, you know, mir traffic mirroring in a uh, central VPC model where uh, traffic from a lot of VPCs, a lot of subnets, a lot of EC2 instances are coming to one central VPC, you can actually set your VXLAN ID such that you can distinguish where this packet is coming from. Very important uh, uh, factor that you need to know is that when we encapsulate the packet with VXLAN header, there is a 56-byte 
of overhead. So if your packet is more than 8,946 8, bytes, we'll truncate that packet. Um, now let's talk about filtering. So the filters in traffic mirroring work similar to um, just like a network ACL, plus there are two more options. Uh, so let's do this, let's do one exercise, let's see, let's create a filter where you want to monitor all your inbound traffic on a web server where traffic's coming on port 80. So I'll start my filter, you know, creating my filter. From the, for the flow direction, I'll pick, I want to mirror all ingress traffic. I I'll pick protocol as TCP. Source, I want traffic coming from anywhere uh, on source port, any, any source port. The destination IP can be my IP because I want to monitor specific traffic only destined to me and the destination port will be port 80. Now, this is very typical of any network ACL rule or filter rule that you specify. There is one more thing you can specify while you're creating a traffic mirroring is packet length. You can choose to actually monitor only, let's say, first 200 bytes or first 100 bytes or first 1,000 bytes of the packet. Uh, and, and that's totally up to you. Uh, by default, we mirror the entire packet. And in this case, I, I'll just say packet length uh, or we'll omit the value where uh, packet length field is. And that's it. Now you have a filter. Any traffic coming in on that port 80 will be mirrored. Now the last piece where you tie these things together is the session. Session, session is the entity that kind of established that relationship between source, target, with the filters. Um, so session has essentially three components. You, you create a session by specifying the source, which is your ENI uh, that you want to monitor. Target, which, is, which you, could be NLB or uh, EC2 instance uh, ENI and the filter. One last thing I want to specify is that you can have up to three mirroring session on a source ENI. This comes in handy when you have, um, you know, let's say you want to mirror HTTP traffic and send it to one tool and let's say rest of the traffic, you want to send it to another tool. We mirror packet only once, but you can have sessions designed such a way that you can have you know lower lower number session session can has numbers and the lower number is the higher priority so you could have session number 1 that can have http filter rule and will essentially mirror that http traffic and a session number 2 can be a catch all to mirror every packet coming on the source now there are many ways you can deploy traffic mirroring and for that i'll invite matt again all right thanks anoop very cool stuff all right. Um, so Noop's been heads down on uh, on building traffic mirroring with the with the AWS folks for about as long as I've known him. So it's great to have him out here and, and talk about how it works. Um, all right. Let's dive into some more advanced topics around traffic mirroring. So first, I want to clear the air with VPC flow logs and traffic mirroring. We'll just do a quick kind of versus between the two. So VPC flow logs are really logs of network flows. So you're gonna get a log entry for the, the network flow itself. Whereas VPC traffic mirroring is the real packet itself. Now, it's the whole packet and you have the ability to truncate if you like as well. With VPC flow logs, the destination is S3 or Amazon CloudWatch logs. With traffic mirroring, it's uh, another ENI or a network load balancer. And we'll talk about scaling in just a moment. Um, with flow logs, each record uh, captures the five tuples. So it's going to be the source destination, uh, source port, destination port, and protocol um, for that specific uh, flow window. With traffic mirroring, it's the real network packet itself. So um, if you want to get visibility into the actual packets themselves, traffic mirroring is definitely the way to go. If you just want some visibility and uh, be, have the ability to look at the log of the flows that are accessing your instances or your VPC, for example, then maybe flow logs is the way to go. Okay. Performance. This is a pretty important topic when we start talking about mirroring whole packets. So how does traffic mirroring affect the performance of my EC2 instance? Well, if we have a, an EC2 instance here and we're, we've got traffic coming in and out, we've got a traffic mirroring uh, session as well, the instance traffic, um, for the mirrored traffic counts towards the performance of that instance itself. So in this case, if we had one gigabits inbound and one gigabits outbound, so we've got symmetrical traffic going to an EC2 instance, we, we're mirroring all traffic, so we're not doing any filters. That would be a total of two gigabits per second of mirrored traffic. So some quick um, second grade math, if I don't 
uh, mess it up here, the total would be four gigabits per second uh, that that instance has to support because we've got one gig inbound, one gig outbound, and those two inbound and outbounds turn into two gig outbound. So that instance actually needs to be able to uh, support double the performance that it would have normally versus if it didn't have traffic mirroring. Now obviously filters have become pretty important in that case. Um, as well, the monitoring instance needs to be able to support the amount of traffic that um, it's going to be receiving as well. And that's this one finished too. I should just put a finished slide on every slide so you guys uh, know when to take a photo. Um, also at the end of the session, my, the last slide is actually my email address. You can sling me a note and I'm happy to share all of these slides with you folks. Um, okay, so. With performance, instance right sizing it does become extremely important. It's important anyway, but when you start adding traffic mirroring, you need to think about that a lot as well. Okay, uh, priority. So when we have normal production traffic and traffic mirroring traffic, the production traffic will actually take a higher priority than traffic mirroring traffic. So if that instance is pushing as many packets as it possibly can, uh, we will actually start dropping traffic mirroring traffic before we would start dropping your normal traffic to an EC2 instance. So that's definitely something to, cons to consider as well. All right, so while we're on the topic, let's talk more about scaling. So we've got an EC2 instance here and we might have another EC2 instance sending it some traffic or we might have um, that EC2 instance is serving traffic out to the internet or something similar. We enable traffic mirroring and we use the uh, target for traffic mirroring, we use the ne uh, network load balancer. In this case, we're actually sending traffic across multiple EC2 instances on the other side as targets of the uh, NLB or network load balancer. We can also have these instances in an auto scaling group so when we start sending more traffic, which is uh, pictured by the red packets here in this case, um, we can actually add more instances or scale up that fleet of monitoring instances behind the network load balancer to be able to handle the total amount of traffic. Let's talk a little bit about flow hashing. So with the network load balancer, we will hash flows across multiple instances. Um, we've been doing this as long as network load balancer has existed in AWS, so we've been um, hashing flows now that we're using, um, we have UDP for network load balancer, which by the way, you can use outside of traffic mirroring. It's available, it's there, there to be used. Um, but traffic mirroring does use UDP. So if we look at the hashing mechanism that the NLB uses here, uh, we'll actually use the protocol, which is UDP, uh, the source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port. Now what will happen is um, a UDP flow that has the same source and destination essentially looks like the same, a single flow, even though UDP doesn't really have the concept of flows, it's just traffic, but they will be sent to the same target. Um, so different UDP flows uh, going to an EC2 instance will probably have different uh, sources in that case, probably the same destination, but they would be hashed to another EC2 instance behind your network load balancer. So UDP um, flow hashing is something to, to think about when you put instances behind a network load balancer, behind traffic mirroring. We can also decentralize our traffic mirroring environment. So in this case, we're using VPC peering. We've got on the right-hand side here a centralized InfoSec VPC, and that has our monitoring instances in it. Um, we've also got a VPC peering connection between our application VPC, for example, and we're sending traffic over the VPC peering connection. So traffic mirroring can be sent to other destinations like VPC peering or, in fact, transit gateway if we wanted to, um, as long as you have routing reachability within the VPC and you're sending um, the route via a transit gateway or VPC peering. So in this case, you can build that centralized InfoSec VPC model and have all of your other instances um, in other VPCs sending traffic to the centralized VPC. These can also be in separate accounts. So in this case, Transit Gateway, for example, can attach to VPCs in multiple different accounts. Um, so you could have your monitoring instance in one account and your application deployment in another account as well. Let's dive in there and check out the console real quick. Now, this looks like a video, but it's not. It's just PowerPoint animation, so um, it won't look exactly uh, like your experience. But if we're here at the AWS Management Console, we jump to VPC. And on the left-hand side here, you'll now have these three additional options here. So mirroring sessions, mirroring targets, and mirroring filters. Now if we jump in and have a look at mirroring sessions, if you don't have any mirroring sessions configured, you'll be confronted with this screen that says no traffic mirroring sessions found. Um, in this case, we're gonna jump in there and just create a mirroring session. 
you'll then um, come across this screen where you can basically name your traffic mirroring session. We'll just call it a random name like traffic mirroring session. You can add a description if you like, of course. The next and um, probably one of the more important pieces here is select the tra traffic mirroring source. So I've got a bunch of EC2 instances in here. I'm just going to select this top uh, instance and this ENI, so ENI uh, D0E, which is the last three digits. We then select our traffic mirroring target. In this case, I've got a target configured already. And then we scroll down because there's a whole bunch of additional configuration we can do. We can set the, the session number, so as Anoop said, we can have up to three sessions. In this case, we're just going to leave that blank, so it'll be um, just one. Um, we can set the VNI or the VXLAN um, network identifier if we like, we'll just leave that blank. Truncating, we can configure that, for example, up to 250 bytes. And then we can select a traffic mirroring filter. In this case, I actually have a traffic mirroring filter that's already been created, and I've just got a bit of a screenshot here to show you folks. So in this case, we've got a rule here. The rule is accept. We're saying TCP, destination port range 8080, with a source seeder of a default router, a 0.0.0.0 slash 0, which is basically an, an any. And then the destination is any as well. We can add a description there too if we like. But in this case, we're really looking for web traffic for this filter. Then we basically, the next screen will be this. Um, I tried to zoom in on this as best I could. It's really hard to read, but basically uh, you'll see that we've got a traffic mirroring session. It's got an ID and the ENI uh, or the source, the target and the session number, etc. So pretty straightforward. Configuration is actually one of the easiest parts here. Um, so what do you actually do with the packets once you, once you receive them, once you've configured your traffic mirroring session? Well. Again, we've got this um, very familiar slide here where um, we've got basically a EC2 instance sending traffic or mirroring traffic to a monitoring instance. And in this case, first up, uh, we have a whole bunch of partners that we've been working with tirelessly to build integrations into traffic mirroring. So uh, folks like ExtraHop, um, Palo Alto Networks, Gigamon, NetScout, um, these are leading edge uh, vendors that, that you folks know and love and have been using on premises for years. Um, we've been working pretty hard to integrate with those vendors and, and these folks have been building integrations into um, the traffic mirroring product. And this is actually something um, our vendors or our APN partners, customers have been asking for a long time and our partners have been asking for a long time. So um, we've worked with every one of these folks to um, deploy these at launch. So folks like Big Switch and Jask as well, Semantic, etc. Um, now we're still working with a lot of our APN partners. So as we go along, you'll notice that a lot of our folks are um, uh, putting out uh, public press releases and blog posts and building integrations. And I heard actually this morning we had uh, Kentic and Darktrace, which are two additional partners that, that additionally built integrations as well. So this list is absolutely going to grow. Um, and we've got a whole um, pipeline of uh, partners that we're going to be working with that will basically be treated as a traffic mirroring destination. And then they'll be able to do something with that traffic on, on your behalf. Next up, um, you can build your own analyzer if you wanted to. Um, I've got a bit of code here. Um, again, um, feel free to take photos and I can share the slides with anyone. But in this case, we've got a user that's doing a HTTP request. And then we want to capture the HTTP request. What does that actually look like? Well, if we were going to build the analyzer out, so if we jump into our um, VI console for a second, this is all simulated, by the way. Um, so we're importing li libraries, in this case, for PCAP. Um, so we, we basically want to capture the packets as they're coming into the mirrored instance. So this is going to run on the mirrored instance itself. We build an agent code, or really, it's, it's not really an agent, it's an analyzer that runs on the instance. So we'll start a PCAP capture on the Elastic Network interface. Um, we'll filter for UDP packets in this case. Um, so we've got our, oh, the pointer doesn't work, but we've got, we're filtering for UDP packets and then um, creating a packet source from the ENI, uh, looking at the VXLAN Ethernet packet itself as it comes into the traffic mirroring um, instance. As we grab the mirrored packet, there's a bunch of code here as well. Um, Feel free to take photos or again, I'm happy to share this with you folks. Um, myself and one of my colleagues sat down for uh, about a day and built this thing and it, it, it works, it's amazing. Um, so let's build it and see what output um, we get here. So we'll jump in here and run our um, traffic mirroring and you'll, you'll see here we've got layer one, layer two, layer three, and this is basically what a PCAP looks like. Um, but if we dive into and we want to capture the actual HTTP packets, 
We've got some additional stuff here as well. So we want to grab the HTTP request from the application payload as it comes into the traffic mirroring instance. And I'm going a little bit fast for that, guys. Again, I'm happy to share this stuff with you as well. So we've got our traffic mirroring destination and we run our um, do-it-yourself traffic mirroring application on there. We've got a traffic mirroring source. So we're running a simple HTTP server. Then we have our browser. We access the web browser and we go to our traffic mirroring page, our Hello World, and you'll see on the left-hand side, we've actually captured the HTTP um, uh, request as it's come into the traffic mirroring um, destination. So you'll see here, we've got the user agent string, uh, we've got source desk, we've actually got the, the actual HTML code itself, so the traffic mirroring Hello World as well. So we're actually seeing that real packet come into our traffic mirroring instance uh, if you wanted to build your own. Um, this is pretty rudimentary though. I'd probably recommend using one of our great APN partners though if you wanted something a little bit more full-fledged, but um, we'll have Dave up in a second to, to tell us about how he's doing a whole bunch of stuff like this. Okay, so after we've got the actual packet capture, we could send things to S3, uh, Kinesis, CloudWatch, etc. And lastly, uh, we do integrate or we have built integrations with open source IDS IPS tools. So. In this case, um, I've got a link here for you folks, but in the docs, uh, we've got working with open source tools for traffic mirroring like Zeek and Suricata as well. And a link there if you guys are interested. That just takes you to the docs. Um, okay. Any other considerations? This is a reasonably important part. So the first is mirrored traffic is not subject to the egress security group on the instance. Now we did this so your application owners basically can't go in and set a security group and block your traffic mirrored packets. So as an InfoSec um, uh, person, you wanna go in there and be able to take those packets and not have a security group affect that. So the egress security group doesn't affect mirrored traffic. Flow logs also don't capture mirrored traffic. So if you've got flow logs from your application team configured, they won't see the mirrored traffic exiting the ENI either. And um, packets will only be mirrored if they pass the inbound security group or network access control list as well. A couple of considerations. Now, um, for something special, <laughs> uh, we've got Dave Burke from our Amazon.com team, uh, one of our principal security um, uh, engineers. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so, as Matt said, I'm Dave Burke. I'm a principal security engineer with Amazon.com. Um, if you think of Amazon, you've all heard of AWS. The other half of, um, of Amazon is the retail, the consumer division. That's where I work. We have our own dedicated security team. We partner with the AWS security team. And what we have to do is we take care of our thousands of development teams, our tens of thousands of AWS accounts across sort of global scale, every AWS region, every AWS service. In order to do our job as ultimately responsible for the security of, of our retail uh, group, is that we love every single AWS security service. Anything that you can give us data. VPC flow logs, guard duty, config, cloud trail. We're just hungry for all that data, whether it's findings from guard duty or the raw data that we'll then go process ourselves, create findings, enrich it for our service teams, and help us drive security up. But why packet capture? Why was it compelling for us? Um, we've been in packet capture for a long time in our legacy, our on-premises environments, our off-net environments, and really, if we compare it to sort of flow data, whether it's VPC flow logs or IP fix data in, in uh, on-premises environments, for us, you know, the, we look at the value add that we get, where it's high fidelity timestamps that allow us really accurately reconstruct uh, event timelines and understand exactly when uh, events were occurring. Um, even as Steve said yesterday, you know, 90% of traffic that we're observing on the internet is now moving to encrypted, whether it's TLS or SSH or anything like that. Um, but the ability to extract metadata, whether it's the certificates, the ciphers being used, there's still value there um, that we can, we can get from that. So packet capture still has a role to play um, and it's still valuable to us. Um, and you know, being able to do things like you know, generate on the fly J3, HASSH, uh, additional signatures allow us to profile the clients, the libraries that are observing inside our environments. And so packet capture still for us plays a very important role. Um, and we really wanted to have that parity in the cloud. Um, but as Amazon, we start with a PRFQ, we start with a press release, we start with a customer quote. 
and the quote, oh, from me, um, was that you know when we did a lot of our packet capture in our on-prem environment, our number one tenet was don't cause harm, don't cause availability impact, don't interfere with the operation of our of our of our websites, our fulfillment centers, um, and we looked at the cloud options. There wasn't an option that, that we would have had to violate one of our tenants, and so traffic mirroring is really that's opened up that opportunity for us. To, to enable what we really understand is a, a really valuable uh, opportunity. Why do we like traffic mirroring, uh, VPC traffic mirroring? I think for us, um, it was as soon as we got access to the feature, we were able to port our applications over. So we have build systems that build our Bro, our Zeek, our Suricata uh, infrastructure. It VPC traffic mirroring presents it as a network interface. We deployed our, our systems, they consumed the packets, they processed them, they streamed them off into the cloud, they went into our processing systems. And so we were up and running very, very, very fast. The, the barrier to entry is really low. Um, we're excited for all the new opportunities that we get that we haven't had in the cloud uh, up until now. So if we think about uh, really sensitive workloads, we have sensitive workloads that need an internet gateway or a NAT gateway or VPC peering but we really, really are sensitive of what traffic is leaving our VPCs. And to be able to look at that traffic and have high confidence that is exactly what is leaving our environment um, is really, we see it as a huge benefit for us. Um, we're a huge company and we continually acquire new companies. And so what we want to be able to do is as we a new AWS account lands in our systems, yes, you can run a whole bunch of describe calls, but maybe you haven't got access to the code yet. We're really excited to be able to start immediately turn on our systems, gain a base level understanding of the activity, compare what maybe the new acquisition or the new account owner has told us they talk to on the internet versus what is realistically talking to uh, on the internet. And then of course, we're a service team for our incident response team, our SOC team, and an opportunity to give them additional tool in their toolbox to be able to go in when they need to and gain additional uh, data from during an incident. I think that's going to be really powerful for us. Um, how are we thinking about using it? Um, so when we pitched this, the first thing we really talked about um, was, you know, what do we've got a case here where we've got a VPC, we've got an EC2 instance running an ENI, and yeah, how everything is working great, normal green traffic flowing in and out of our VPC, but we then start seeing some bad traffic. The system works, guard duty processes it, Let's imagine it's something like an IP address that's sitting on an IOC indicator list. GuardDuty does the right thing. It, it's going to alert, it's going to fire an alert in a CloudWatch events. But what we think is uh, the value add for us is going to be is saying, well, maybe we want to know what was they talking to that IP address about? What was the actual communication? And so routing that alert into a Lambda function, allowing the Lambda function to identify the ENI, all the metadata that we need, and then go spin up on demand one of our monitoring uh, AMIs, create the mirroring instance, create the traffic mirroring session, and send the packets over. And then whether we've decided if it's appropriate in the Lambda function to deploy uh, Zeek or Suricata, we're then going to have those logs stream off into our S3 buckets, and we'll see the logs shipping now. Um, and then we're just going to give our, you know, we now can come along as humans, we can look at the logs. We can really deeply understand. We I understand what you know. Steve Schmidt was saying yesterday about you know automation is the key here, but we want to be able to deliver the right data to the humans at the right time to really make that high judgment call. And so being able to do that is, is going to be really uh, useful for us. Um, and then once we're done, once we've made the decisions, or our timer expires, then we'll do our cleanup. We'll tear down the monitoring instance. We'll tear down the monitoring session. And we're now back to all the bad traffic has gone away. We've just got that green traffic flowing in and out. But we've left the traffic uh, or the logs there for our response team. Um, the other option we have here is let's say we have maybe it's not guard duty. Maybe it's one of our other monitoring systems. Maybe it's the service owner telling us there's something gone wrong or suspicious with their instance. And so we want to give our instant response uh, team the capability. Maybe they'll hit an API gateway. They'll provide the metadata that they need. Um, they'll tell it, here's the ENI ID, I want to spin up uh, a Zeek uh, session for me. And again, we're just going to rig in a Lambda session um, and let it do the spin up of the instances, run the instance, create the traf VPC traffic mirroring session for us, take those logs, again, send them across the ENI, send them into S3, 
Send him into Athena and alert our incident response team. Hey, I did what he told. There's the logs now streaming in. You have live visibility into all the activity during an event, just giving them that really uh, strong signals and helping them make even more uh, informed decisions. And then, of course, again, once we're finished, just make sure we just clean up after ourselves and we don't use any of the resources that the account holder might have. But we've left really high quality and high fidelity logs behind. Uh, this is a, a more complicated session here. So what we, in our on-premise environment, we know that sometimes, you know, you might be monitoring the perimeter firewall, the edge firewall, and really saying, I just really want to understand the traffic uh, going out to the internet, going out to untrusted networks. Um, and so, you know, I'm less concerned maybe about east-west traffic, it's more about north-south traffic. And so here we've got, you know, pre-configured, we've got an EC2 instance, it's now sending traffic to an NLB, we've got an auto-scaling um, uh, server behind it, and again, logs are streaming out. But the problem is it's an auto-scaling group, maybe on the right-hand side, or a service owner creates a new um, uh, instance, and so now we've got an unmanaged or unmapped uh, ENI that's appeared inside our VPC. But the good thing, of course, is um, if you're, you run an instance, you generate a CloudTrail event, all we're going to do is just send that CloudTrail stream over to Lambda, um, let it figure out, okay, what are the ENIs that have launched? Um, what is the filter? So filter out that east-west traffic, build, pre-build me the filter on the fly so that I only want to see that north-south traffic. Um, and then just go to the ENI, add the VPC traffic mirroring session, and map it the target onto um, the uh, oops the uh, the NLB here, and so again what we'll see is we'll see all our traffic now the blue and the green flowing through from the auto scaling group through the NLB to an auto scaling monitoring service, and logs going into uh, our Athena cluster, and so we're now replicating what we've had in an on-premise environment, which is that edge perimeter monitoring with the right tooling at the right time. Um, the, we, we view this as a game changer, and, and that's, this is only the start. We're, we're still just excited about all the opportunities. Um, if you think about it in your on-premise environment, you know, for us deploying physical boxes, you're months out. You're trying to say, I've got to pre-size the instance. I've got a, a range of fiber optic uh, tap insulation. I've got to shift traffic. I've got to you know, make sure, did I want a Zeek box there, a Suricata box there? Did I want to just raw PCAP box, uh, cap, packet capture box there? Um, Whereas now it is seconds that we're going to be up and running. And so our ability to do experimentation and, and try out new things um, is something that, you know, for people who do packet capture, uh, it's just we've never had that before. So it's really, really exciting. Um, and also, I think as Anoop said earlier, the customization of workloads, um, maybe starting with PCAP, replaying it through different types of tools, finding for, you know, which VPC is the right tooling. Um, sometimes it might be Suricata, sometimes it might be uh, Zeek, sometimes it might just be raw PCAP that you want to store. Um, but the ability to experiment to replay without having to worry about you know, large disks and storing data, you know, you've got S3 for, for, for doing that now. Um, so you know, to, to clone an Amazon phrase, we really think this is day one of Packet Capture, really excited, and really think that you know, this is so many exciting opportunities in the coming years. Uh, thank you, and I'll hand it back to Matt. All right. Can you folks hear me again? I have to swap my mic. Okay, excellent. Um, thanks, Dave. That was absolutely awesome to get a, a view into what Amazon is actually uh, going to be doing with traffic mirroring. So I've got a couple of final thoughts here. Um, and just really quickly, I mean, we touched on VPC flow logs. I think VPC flow logs still has a place in AWS. And I think it's really something that uh, it's not really a, do I want to use flow logs or traffic mirroring? It's a, I probably want to use both in, in certain scenarios. Um, we dove pretty deeply into traffic mirroring as well. So there's a lot of different options there around mirroring traffic to instances, NLBs, um, using our uh, APN partners, building your own traffic analyzer, built using open source um, software as well that integrates uh, with traffic mirroring as well. A couple of things to consider, performance obviously, how you're going to deploy your traffic mirroring instances, whether they're in the same VPC as your applications, maybe they're in a centralized VPC for your InfoSec folks to manage, etc. Um, but Overall, traffic mirroring is one of those things we've been waiting for for quite some time with AWS. So I'm personally really excited that we now have this feature and um, can't wait to dive in there and use it with a lot of my customers. Um, and lastly, Dave gave us some real world examples of um, how we're really planning to use traffic mirroring.
Lastly here, um, just a bit of a quirky quote. Uh, so human beings have five fingers, five toes, five appendages, five senses, and there's also five arms on a regular starfish, and an earthworm has five hearts. That said, if you think we're worth it, don't forget to fill out your evaluation, and we love fives. Um, <laughs> but that's all we've got for you folks today. Please take a photo of this slide as well. Um, if you want the slides, send it to this. Hopefully my inbox doesn't get too overloaded. I'm happy to share. There's actually 113 slides in this session. Session, um, whole bunch of code, whole bunch of stuff that you guys can digest. We will be doing a similar session at the New York Summit as well in about a month's time. Um, it'll be a little bit different, but if you make it to New York, um, you'll see one of my colleagues who actually built the uh, open source analyzer um, stuff. He'll be presenting that there as well. So thanks very much for coming, guys. Um, great to have you here.